I've used the words risk, uncertainty, variability, I don't know how many times in this conversation so far. Uh, you probably use them in daily work life. What's the risk? What's the uncertainty? The problem we have is these are words that we use in the vernacular. We think we know what we mean, but we're in fact not entirely sure. When somebody says risk, how is that different from uncertainty or variability? How do these things all work together? So what I want to do is I want to start our conversation by being clear about our definitions and by making sure we understand mathematically, intellectually, conceptually, what the difference between these things are. And in order to do that, let's pick a concrete example. Let's pick something that we can get our, our mind around. I'm going to be doing examples later on around project schedule or costs, so let's pick something different. Suppose we're bringing a new product to market. I don't know, we have a new form of magic marker that's going to revolutionize the market. We've got to set contracts in place. We have to go to potential suppliers and sign contracts of guaranteed volumes for certain pricing. Or if we're going to make these ourselves, we're going to have to go ahead and invest in, in factory space and equipment and all sorts of things. And one of the fundamental things we have to understand before we can sign contracts, set up a supply chain, purchase equipment, or whatever it is we're going to do is how many do we think we're going to sell? So let's use that to try to distinguish between risk and uncertainty and all of these ideas. So the starting point of talking about these ideas is with the word uncertainty. I'm going to be very specific. The variable that I am uncertain about is how many of these I believe I will sell per month for the first six months or eight months or something like that. Let's make it very simple. Let's assume it goes straight up to a volume and once it gets there, now we know the number. How many of these are we going to sell? In order to do that, I'm going to create a range down here on the bottom. And that range can go from zero to some very large number. I'll call this volume max. Okay? And this axis is going to be volume. Sales, if you will. Now, I don't know how many I'm going to sell. I am trying to predict what is going to happen in the future. By trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, that means I cannot put a single number down there. I can't say 10,000. I can't say 150,000. What I have to say is there's a range of possible volumes I might sell. I guess at one level, the minimum I could possibly sell is zero. Nobody buys it, I sell zero. At the other level, it might be whatever I think the maximum physical volume is, is even possible. But the reality is all of those possibilities between zero and maximum volume are not all equal. There's kind of more likely outcomes and less likely outcomes. So when I take this range, what I have to do is I have to start thinking about the probability of it. So those of you who've had statistics and you think about this, this is just what's called the probability density function. And let's say that we go through some process, we'll talk about how in a bit, we go through some process where through judgment, through data, through, through experience, we end up saying, I believe the range, monthly sales, is likely to be between 10,000 on the low side per month and 200,000 on the high side per month. So now we have start talking in a range, we're going to sell between 10,000 and 200,000, but that's a big range, a big set of possibilities, plus they're not always equal. So what if I started saying, and when I think about it, I think the relative likelihood of all these maybe has a shape like that. We're going to call this a range estimate. This is the probability density function at top. This is the range of possibilities that we think are, are realistic down at the bottom. And this right here is often going to carry a certain shape. It's going to have skew to it. You're probably used to, if you will, very nicely shaped normal curves where 
the room above is equal to the room below and so forth. But in reality, we often find different shapes than this. And we're going to just kind of generally think of it as saying there might be a bulk of possibilities right here with some kind of tail possibilities on either end. This is what we call a range estimate. And the range estimate is the foundation for making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Now, oftentimes people will want to talk about this as if we can then calculate, if you will, the expected value, the mu that you guys are familiar with. And maybe the expected value in this particular thing is 30,000 sales per month. And oftentimes we will just collapse this range estimate down to 30,000 per month. We're just going to plan on 30,000. The problem is, once you pick a single number like that, you're kind of in a lot of trouble because 30,000 doesn't tell you about anything about the possible extremes that you have to manage against. So I prefer, and really industry prefers in these big decision-making problems, to actually express a range estimate a little bit differently. Instead of just collapsing it all to a single number like 30,000, let's try to express our relative certainty or uncertainty around it. So that's what this allows us to do. We are going to use the word uncertainty. When we use the word uncertainty in mathematics, we're saying I cannot pin a single number against the outcome of this volume here. I cannot tell you tomorrow with certainty what that number is going to be. All I can tell you is the range of numbers that it's possible to be. And therefore, uncertainty is depicted through a range estimate. Now, in our example up till now, I've said, let's try to think of the lowest bound on it. Let's try to think of the highest bound on this. Let's think of the average value. Those are ways that people who haven't done a lot of work on this sometimes think. I'd like to propose a different way of thinking about it. If you remember your statistics, or maybe you haven't ever heard this, the problem is when you're talking about the lowest number something can take on, that's a very ill-defined number. It's hard to get down to something that's the absolute lowest possibility. So I don't like to talk about a number like 10,000 as the lowest possibility. I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about a number that is a low-end number. Since volume is good for us, the low-end number in this might be the pessimistic number we plan against. So I'm going to create a term. I'll use the label A. And this is going to be our pessimistic guess, or our pessimistic range. And we're going to define pessimistic instead of all the way down to that lowest number that we used to think was somewhere around 10,000. We're going to call this A, and in this case it might be 12,000 markers per month. And we're going to define it as the number that we think there's only a 5% chance of being lower than. So. The pessimistic number is the 5% number. Only a 5% chance it's lower than that, a 95% chance it's higher than that. Conversely, on the other side, this big number, it could be as high as 200,000, becomes very hard to say, well, I don't know, could it be 500,000? Could it be a million? So let's again eliminate this idea of an absolute end to our range. And let's construct something similar to the A. Let's call it B. And B will be our optimistic number. All right? And in a like manner to A, we're going to say B is the number at which there's only a 5% chance of greater than that number. So we'll call this the 95% number. There's a 95% chance it will be lower and only a 5% chance it will be higher. So we're starting to bound our uncertainty by talking about the optimistic side, excuse me, the pessimistic side. I don't think there, there's only a 5% chance of it being lower than 12,000. And the optimistic side, well, there's only a 5% chance of it being higher than, let's say, 180,000. Later on, we'll talk about how you might get these numbers. Now, those give us what are called the range boundaries. In addition to the range boundaries, this number here is actually a very important number. It is the peak of the distribution there. 
It's the point that if you were to do this guess many times and get more and more data, what you think the most likely outcome is. Those of you who remember your statistics, this is sometimes called the mode. But we're going to use the term most likely. And it's the peak, the highest point in the distribution. In a histogram, it would be the bin that had the most possible outcomes. And we'll call this the most likely M. And maybe this is 30,000. Now, once you start thinking of our uncertainty in this manner, our inability to predict exactly what something's going to be, so we're going to define it by a range estimate. And that range estimate is going to be defined by a pessimistic outcome. What's the lowest reasonable number? Only a 5% chance of lower. Or on the high end, what's an optimistic number? Only a 5% chance that it could actually exceed that. And then what's the most likely outcome? What do we really think it's going to be? You can start doing a lot of work with range estimates by thinking about it like this. And this is how we're going to characterize uncertainty. Now, there is a special meaning behind, whoops, I said 30,000. I'm going to change this number now because people often confuse these two. Let's figure out the 50-50 chance, all right? The 50-50. I'm doing this in a different color because it's a different concept. Now, we're not going to worry too much about the difference between the mean and the median, but the idea is there's a 50-50 chance of being higher or lower than a particular number. One of the things that we're going to learn throughout the, this course is when there is a difference, when there is skew and one side has a tail compared to the other side, the mu is a different number than the most likely. That is, the most likely outcome is in fact not the same as the 50-50 outcome, and this becomes important. So here is a picture of how we might describe uncertainty. I have simply made up these numbers. Don't be concerned with the numbers right now. We'll be showing you how to do them later. But this is a very comprehensive picture of uncertainty, because I can make decisions being given this information, whereas I could not make very effective decisions if I didn't take into consideration the range of possible outcomes. So this is uncertainty. We're going to be using this concept a lot throughout the course. But I kept on using risk and variability before. How does that fit into this? Well, we've constructed a little video that will try to demonstrate this as it's applied in the oil and gas industry. But the same concepts apply here. So I think that that will illustrate many of these ideas. But very briefly, before you see this video, let me give you an idea of how this is going to work. The idea is, what creates the uncertainty? Why can't I tell you a single number against how many you're going to sell? Well, obviously, it's in the future. I don't know exactly how much I'm going to sell in each region. I don't know whether customers are going to like it or not like it. I don't know whether a competitor is going to come out with something similar. So it's kind of all of these unknown things that create uncertainty around the demand of this product in the future. What we do is we actually divide this into two distinct concepts. We say there are two things that give rise here. One thing we're going to call variability, and another thing we're going to call a risk event. There may be multiple risk events. There may be multiple variabilities. These are the things that give rise to this, and I'd like to describe a little bit of it right now and then let you see the video from the oil and gas industry to understand this better. But let's talk about the difference between variability and risk event. Variability is a fact. There's no um, yes, no to variability. There is a fact. So in this range estimate of how many I'm going to sell, a fact is every day won't be like another. Some days I will sell more, some days I will sell less because customers come in, they don't come in, customers see our advertisement later, they don't see our advertisement. These are variability that leads to an inability to exactly predict it. But in variability, it's a little hard to explain in the context of this example, variability is something that we can use our standard mathematics to try to predict. We can look at past history 
of data? What did other markers that we introduced to the market sell? What do our competitors sell? What are their volumes? What are their values? So variability is something that our basic statistical mathematics applies well to, as opposed to perhaps it's easier to understand what a risk event is. A risk event is something that may or may not happen. So a risk event is a yes-no outcome, whereas variability is a fact, we just can't put a single number to it. A risk event. There's the possibility that one of our competitors is working on a similar technology of marker to what we are. And there's the possibility they may beat us to market. And if they beat us to market, it's going to have a very dramatic impact on whether or not we can sell these things. That is a risk event. And the reason that's a risk event is it's yes or no. Is a competitor working on this and did they beat us to market or did they not beat us to market? There's a yes no outcome with respect to a risk event. There is a mathematical difference between variability which uses our traditional statistics and risk events which tends to not be very amenable to our traditional statistics. Variability leads to the basic shape of the body of the distribution. And it says, if we throw away the outliers, here is the typical range of outcome. Forecasting data, historical data, um, mathematical models of what are happening, um, summing of sales from different regions. All of these are a source of variability that give us a pretty good idea of what the main body of the possible outcomes are. Risk events are different. Risk events, because they're zero, one, yes, no events, these things either happen or don't happen, and they tend to tell you the size of the tail of the distribution. And it turns out that tails of distributions are actually the most difficult part of making business decisions. We have lots of tools that help us understand what happens in the middle of this distribution. We have fewer tools and they are less useful to tell us what happens in the tail. I think the best explanation of what you're seeing here will be in this very entertaining, hopefully, video that talks about trying to predict the cost of an oil and gas project.